Welcome to the online course on Nibbana Sermons 12 to 22 by Bhikkhu Katekurunda Nyanananda, collaboration by the Numata Center for Buddhist Studies at the University of Hamburg and the Barra Center for Buddhist Studies in Massachusetts. And today we are going to see Sermon 22. But before that, just a few extracts from the very interesting online discussion. There's a Bikuni Damadina about this whole discussion of the Tetralemma. I think this is an important perspective brought in by Bikuni Ananda in view of the use of the Buddha's presumed silence with respect to the Ten Questions as a proof for the Buddha's supposed agnosticism that is proposed in some contemporary readings. The choice is not merely not to answer the questions, and the choice is not made out of a declaration of not knowing, or of them being marginal or even irrelevant. You know, for example, the Buddha being a mere empiricist or rationalist. Rather, the choice is to reframe their very premises. And George Olaya, with his usual poetic uh, expressions about that simile of the sand castles. The whirling's vista of sun castles clutching the dear aggregates. We are stuck, tightly stuck, when our body has such a way with words, owning and attaching. The remedy to demolish the mirage of this view, kick apart these sun castles, put it out of play, leaving nothing to be grasped or given up. So much for the enchantment of being a being takes the breath away. And Yin Cheng on the vertex simile. In addition to rounds of life cycles, the winding pattern of ignorance is vividly visible in the present life. One often gets caught by rounds of greed, aversion and delusion again and again. Our habitual unwholesome behaviors are similar to the life cycles. With ignorance in the background, we forget the suffering we endured moments ago and we repeat again and again, like a vortex. For me, this brought a heightened intention to practice. And Robert Grosch also on the vortex. When stopping for a moment, reflecting that all this, what happens, just a whirling around, merely causing a whirling around in my mind, it was possible to step out of the frenzy for a while. So I found the vortex simile, illusion, very helpful and powerful indeed, even for everyday reflection, while the depth or breadth of the reach of this simile is also very fascinating. Elision. An everyday situation, the restless mind, elision. a whole being, name and form and consciousness, and even the whole of samsara can be observed from the perspective of the vortex simile. And with these few excerpts, we are now ready for Sermon 22. Etang santang etang panitang yadidang sabba sankara samato sabu upadi patini sabgo tanagayo virago nirodo nipala. This is peaceful, this is excellent, namely the stilling of all preparations, the relinquishment of all assets, the destruction of craving, detachment, cessation, extinction. With the permission of the most venerable great preceptor and the assembly of the venerable meditative monks, this is the 22nd sermon in the series of sermons on Nibbana. We made an attempt in our last sermon to explain that the comparison of the emancipated one in this dispensation to the great ocean has a particularly deep significance. We reverted to the simile of the vortex by way of explanation. Release from the samsaric vortex or the bridge of the vortex of samsara is comparable to the cessation of a whirlpool. It is equivalent to the stoppage of the whirlpool of samsara. Generally, what is known as a vortex or a whirlpool is a certain pervert, unusual or abnormal activity, which sustains the pretense of an individual existence in the great ocean, with a drilling and churning as its center. It is an aberration, functioning according to a duality, maintaining a notion of two things. 
as long as it exists, there is the dichotomy between a here and a there, one self and another. A vortex reflects a conflict between an internal and an external, a tangle within and a tangle without. The cessation of the vortex is the freedom from that duality. It is a solitude born of full integration. We happen to discuss the meaning of the term Kevali in our last sermon. The cessation of a vortex is at once the resolution of the conflict between an internal and an external, of the tangle within and without. When a vortex ceases, all those conflicts subside and a state of peace prevails. What remains is the boundless great ocean, with no delimitations of a here and a there. As is the great ocean, so is the vortex now. This suchness itself indicates the stoppage, the cessation or the subsidence of the vortex. There is no longer any possibility of pointing out a here and a there. In the case of a vortex that has ceased, its thusness or suchness amounts to an acceptance of the reality of the great ocean. That thus gone vortex, or the vortex that has now become such, is in every respect worthy of being called Tathagata. The term Tadi is also semantically related to this suchness. The Tathagata is sometimes referred to as Tadi or Tadiso, such like. The such-like quality of the Tathagata is associated with his unshakable deliverance of the mind. His mind remains unshaken before the eight worldly vicissitudes. Why the Buddha refused to give an answer to the tetralemma concerning the after-death state of the Tathagata should be clear to a great extent by those sutta quotations we brought up in our last sermon. Since the quotation Dittiva Dhamme Satchato Thetato Tathagati Anupalabhya Mani, when a Tathagata is not to be found in truth and fact here in this very life, leads to the inference that the Tathagata is not to be found in reality even while he is alive, we are forced to conclude that the question what happens to the Tathagata after his death is utterly meaningless. It is also obvious from the conclusive statement Formerly, as well as now, I make known just suffering and the cessation of suffering. That the Buddha, in answering this question, completely put aside such conventional terms like being and a person, and solved the problem on the basis of the Four Noble Truths, which highlight the pure quintessence of the Dhamma as it is. We have to go a little deeper into this question of conventional terms like being and person, because the statement that the Tathagata doesn't exist in truth and fact is likely to drive fear into the minds of the generality of people. In our last sermon, we gave a clue to an understanding of the sense in which this statement is made. When we quoted an extraordinary new etymology, the Buddha had advanced for the term satta in the Radha Sanyutta. Rupe ko Radha yo chando yo rago ya nandi ya tanha tatra satto tatra visatto tasma satto di utnjati. Radha, that desire, that lust, that delight, that craving in form, with which one is attached and thoroughly attached, therefore is one called a being. Comment translation by Bikavodi. <coughs> One is stuck, rather, <coughs> tightly stuck in desire, lust, delight, and craving for form. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, lust, delight, and craving for feeling, for perception, for volitional formations, for consciousness. Therefore, one is called a being. In the Samyukta Agama parallel, being defiled by attachment to and entangled with bodily form, this is called a living being. Being defiled by attachment to and entangled with feeling, perception, formations, consciousness, this is called a living being. End of comment. Here the Buddha has punned on the word satta to give a new orientation to its meaning that is rupe sattu visattu, attached and thoroughly attached to form. 
From prehistoric times, the word satta was associated with the idea of some primordial essence called sat, which carried with it notions of permanent existence in the world. As derivatives from the present particle sant and sat, we get the two words satya and sattva in Sanskrit. Satya means truth, or what is true. Sattva means a being, or the state of being. We might even take sattva as the place from which there is a positive response or an affirmation of a state of being. Due to the semantic affinity between satya truth and sattva being, an absolute reality had been granted to the term sattva from ancient times. But according to the new etymology advanced by the Buddha, the term sattva is given only a relative reality within limits, that is to say, it is real only in a limited and a relative sense. The above quotation from the Rada Samyutta makes it clear that a being exists only so long as there is that desire, lust and delight and craving in the five aggregates. Alternatively, when there is no desire or lust or delight or craving for any of the five aggregates, there is no being. That is why we say that it is real only in a limited and relative sense. When a thing is dependent on another thing, it is relative, and for that very reason it has limited applicability and is not absolute. Here, in this case, the dependence is on desire or attachment. As long as there is desire or attachment, there is a being. And when it is not there, there is no being. So from this we can well infer that the Tathagata is not a being by virtue of the very definition he had given to the term Satta. The other day we briefly quoted a certain simile from the Radha Sutta itself, but could not explain it sufficiently. The Buddha gives this simile just after advancing the above new definition. Suppose Radha, some little boys and girls are playing with sand castles. So long as their lust, desire, love, thirst, passion and craving for those things have not gone away, they remain fond of them, they play with them, treat them as their property and call them their own. But when rather those little boys and girls have outgrown that lust, desire, love, thirst, passion and craving for those sun castles, they scatter them with their hands and feet, demolish them, dismantle them and render them unplayable. When we reflect upon the meaning of this simile from the point of view of Dhamma, it seems that for those little boys and girls, sand castles were real things, as long as they had ignorance and craving with regard to them. When they grew wiser and outgrew craving, those sand castles became unreal. That is why they destroyed them. The untaught worldling is in a similar situation. So long as he is attached to these five aggregates and has not comprehended their impermanent, Suffering fraught and not self nature, they are real for him. He is bound by his own grasping. The reality of the law of karma, of merit and demerit, follows from that very grasping. The dictum upadana patanchaya bhavo, dependent on grasping his existence, becomes meaningful in this context. There is an existence because there is grasping. But at whatever point of time wisdom dawned and craving faded away, all those things tend to become unreal. There is not even a being, as there is no real state of being. This mode of exposition receives support from the Kachaya Nagotta Sutta of the Samyutta Nikaya. The way the Buddha has defined right view in that discourse is highly significant. We have already discussed this sutta on an earlier occasion. Suffice it to remind ourselves of the basic maxim. Dukkam eva upanjamanam upanjati, dukkam nirunjamanam nirunjati, nakankati, navichikichati, aparapanjaya jnana ve vasa etta hoti, et ntavata koka chayana samma ditti hoti. It is only suffering that arises and suffering that ceases. Understanding thus, one does not doubt, one does not waver. And there is in him only the knowledge that is not dependent on another. It is in so far kachayana that one has right view. Common translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. He has no perplexity or doubt that what arises is only suffering arising. 
what ceases is only suffering ceasing. His knowledge about this is independent of others. It is in this way, Kachana, that there is right view. And here's the Chinese parallel. What is called, end of comment, what is called Aparabhajaya Jnana is that knowledge of realization by oneself, for which one is not dependent on another. The noble disciple wins to such a knowledge of realization in regard to this fact, namely that it is only a question of suffering and its cessation. The right view mentioned in this context is supramundane right view, and not that right view which takes kamma as one's own, kamma sakata samaditi, implying notions of I and mine. The supramundane right view brings out the norm of Dhamma as it is. Being unable to understand this norm of Dhamma, Contemporary ascetics and Brahmins, and even some monks themselves, accused the Buddha of being an annihilationist. They brought up groundless allegations. There was also the opposite reaction of seeking refuge in a form of eternalism, through fear of being branded as annihilationists. Sometimes the Buddha answered those wrong accusations in unmistakable terms. We come across such an instance in the Alagandupama Sutta. First of all, the Buddha qualifies the emancipated one in his dispensation with the terms Aryo Pannadajo Pannabharo Isangyato. Once the conceit M, Asmimana, is abandoned, this noble one is called Pannadajo, one who has put down the flag of conceit. He has laid down the burden, Pannabharo, and is disjoined, Visangyato, from the fetters of existence. About this emancipated one, he now makes the following declaration. Evang vimutta chitntang ko bhikkhave bhikkhong sa inda deva sa pajapatika sa brahmaka anve sang nadigat nchanti idang nisitang tathagata sa vinyananti. Tanki sa hetu, ditte vang bhikkhave dhamme tataro an anuve jyoti vadami. Evang vadin komang bhikkhave evang akhai. Eke samana brahmana asata tucha musa abhoten abhachit nkanti. Vinayeko samana bhutamo sato sat ntasa utnchirang vinnasang vibhavang panya peti. A monk thus released in mind of monks, gods including Indra, Pajapati and Brahma, are unable to trace in their search to be able to see of him. The consciousness of this thus gone one is dependent on this. And why is that so? Monks, I say even here and now, the Tathagata is not to be found. When I say thus, when I teach thus, some recluses and Brahmins wrongly and falsely accuse me with the following unfounded allegation. Recluse Gautama is an annihilationist. He lays down an annihilation, a distraction and non-existence of a truly existing being. Comment translation by Nyanamoni. Because when the gods with Indra, with Brahma and with Pajapati seek a bhikkhu who is thus liberated in mind, they do not find it, anything of which they could say. The consciousness of one thus gone is supported by this. Why is that? One thus gone, I say, is untraceable here and now. So saying bhikkhus, so proclaiming, I have been baselessly, vainly, falsely and wrongly misrepresented by some recluses and Brahmins thus. The recluse Gautama is one who leads astray. He teaches the annihilation, the destruction, the extermination of an existing being. And here's the Madhyama Agama parallel. Indra with his devas, Isana and Brahma with his assembly seek a basis on which the consciousness of a Tathagata depends, but are unable to find one. A Tathagata has become Brahma, a Tathagata has become cool, a Tathagata is without heat, a Tathagata is not otherwise. It is like this, I say. Renunciants and Brahmins misrepresent me, saying what is false and untrue, namely, the renunciant Gautama proclaims annihilation. He proclaims the cutting off and destruction of a truly existing living being. I do not make proclamations about what, in this context, is in any case devoid of self. I do, however, proclaim the last gone one to be without worry right here and now. End of comment. 
As in the Anuradha Sutta, here too the Buddha concludes with the highly significant statement of his stance. Pumbe chang itarai cha dukkhan cheva panyapi mi dukkhan Formerly as well as now, I make known just suffering and the cessation of suffering. Though the statements in the sutta follow this trend, it seems that the commentator himself was scared to bring out the correct position in his commentary. The fact that he sets out with some trepidation is clear enough from the way he tackles the term Tathagata in his commentary to the above discourse in the Manjima Nikaya. In commenting on the word Tathagatasa in the relevant context, he makes the following observation. Tathagatasati etta sattopi tathagatodi adipeto uttama pugalokin asavohi. Tathagatas, herein being also is meant by the term Tathagata, as well as the highest person, the influx free Arahant. Comment, yeah, this brings me to the reading for this uh, lecture, which is an article I wrote on the term Tathagata, and also I'm focusing on different Chinese translation. It also has something about the Pali derivation and also about this commentary, which at first I was a little bit at difficulties to understand, but eventually it became clear that the commentary is actually talking about the usage of the Tathagata first by those outside of the Buddhist dis, uh, dispensation. So those see the Tathagata as a real being. And then the second explanation is uh, uh, the way the Buddha and his disciples used it maybe as a supreme uh, being without any notion of a satta, of a being behind there, that the Buddha and his Arahant disciples, I should say. And I think this also helps a little bit put into perspective the criticism that the Venabhanyanananda will be voicing now about the commentary. I think if we, the commentary is a bit cryptic and so it's easily uh, to not fully get the point made there. But if we understand that it's simply reporting on these two different usages, the commentary becomes a little bit more clear. And so what the commentary is simply saying is some use the word Tathagata with the belief in a being and such a being is simply non-existent. That is just besides the point. But others, including the Buddha, use it to refer to a, to the highest, uh, to the one who is realized, the Arahant. And uh, of course, an Arahant exists in some way, but only as a process, as a process of condition uh, formations that are still there. And so uh, the Arahant or the Tathagata cannot be pinned down to any of the aggregates because they're no longer clinging to them. I think this is the point of the, the commentary is trying to make. And I wanted to also briefly add to the above the uh, para from the that is also found in Anuradha Sutta, the formerly as well as known, I make known dukkha and the cessation of dukkha, that this is not found in the Madhyama Arama parallel. End of comment. Just as he gives two meanings to the word Tathagata, Venerable Buddha Gosa attributes two meanings to the word an Anuvenju as well. An Anuvenju ti asangvinjamano va avindeyo va. Tathagato hi satte gaite asangvinjamano ti atto vattati. Kina asave gaite avindeyo ti atto vattati. An Anuvenju, non existing or untraceable. When by the word Tathagata a being is meant, the sense non-existing is fitting. And when the influx-free one is meant, the sense untraceable is fitting. According to this exegesis, the term Tathagata in context where it means a being is to be understood as non-existing, as Sangvinyamana, which is equivalent in the sense to the expression Anupalamnyamana discussed above. On the other hand, the other sense attributed to it is avindeyo, which somehow grants the existence but suggests that it is untraceable. In other words, the Tathagata exists, but it cannot be traced or found out. The commentary opines that the term in question has to be understood in two different senses, according to context. In order to substantiate his view, the commentator attributes the following apocryphal explanation to the Buddha. Vikngave ahang dittiva damme dharmanakam yeva ki nasavam vinyana vasena inda dihi avindiyam vadami. Nahi sa inda deva sa brahma kasa pajaparika ave santapi ki nasavasa vipassana chitamba magna chitamba 
Palachitangma. Inang nama aramanam nisaya vattati ti janitam sakkonti. Te apitisandi kasa parinibmuta saking janis sandi. Monks, I say that even here and now, the influx free one, while he is alive, is untraceable by Indra and others in regard to his consciousness. Gods, including Indra, Brahma and Pajapati, I need unable in their search to find out either the inside consciousness or the path consciousness or the fruition consciousness, to be able to say it is dependent on this object. How then could they find out the consciousness of one who has attained Parinibbana with no possibility of conception? Presumably the argument is that since the consciousness of the Arant is untraceable by the gods while he is alive, it is all the more difficult for them to find it out when he has attained Parinibbana. That is to say, the Arahant somehow exists even after his Parinibbana, only that he cannot be traced. It is obvious from this commentarial trend that the commentator finds himself on the horns of a dilemma because of his inability to grasp an extremely deep dimension of linguistic usage. The Buddha's forceful and candid declaration was too much for him. Probably he demurred out of excessive faith, but his stance is not in accordance with the Dhamma. It falls short of right view. Comment, yeah, is perhaps a little bit strong. I think the commentator's basic exposition can still be seen uh, in a different light if we simply understand that uh, the point is to show the difference between the two usages of the Tathagata. And so the only thing that I think can really be objected uh, against is the suggestion that there is still a consciousness after the Parinibbana that could be known in principle. So that is, uh, I, I, I see that can be criticized, but just to bring in right view is perhaps a nuance too strong, I think. End of comment. Let us now recapitulate the correct position in the light of the above Sutta passage. The Buddha declares at the very outset that the emancipated monk undergoes a significant change by virtue of the fact that he has abandoned the conceit M. Then the targeter, that emancipated monk, who has put down the flag of conceit, lay down the burden of the five aggregates, and upon release from the fetters to existence, defies definition and eludes categorization. Why is that? As we pointed out earlier, the word asmi constitutes the very basis of the entire grammatical structure. Asmi or M is the basic peg, which stands for the first person. The second person and the third person come later. So asmi is basic to the grammatical structure. When this basic peg is uprooted, the emancipated monk reaches that state of freedom from the vortex. There is no dichotomy to sustain a vortex, no two teams to keep up the vertical interplay. When there is no turning round, there is no room for designation. And this is the implication of the phrase Vattante Sangnati Panya Panaya, which we happen to quote on a previous occasion. For the Arahants, there is no vortex whereby to designate. That is why the Tathagata, in this very life, is said to have transcended the state of a being. Only as a way of speaking in terms of worldly parlance, one cannot help referring to him as a being. But in truth and fact, his position is otherwise. Going by worldly usage, one might indiscriminately think of applying the four propositions of the Tetralemma to the Tathagata as well. But it is precisely in this context that the question and presumptions are fully exposed. The fact that he has misconceived the implications of the term Satta and Tathagata is best revealed by the very question whether the Tathagata exists after his death. It shows that he presumes the Tathagata to be existing in truth and fact, and if so, he has either to go on existing or be annihilated after death. Here then we have an extremely deep dimension of linguistic usage. The commentary says that gods and brahmas cannot find the Tathagata in point of his consciousness. The Tathagata defies definition due to his abandonment of proliferations of cravings, conceits and views. Cravings, conceits and views, which bring in attachments, bindings and entanglements, to justify the usage of terms like satta, being and pugala person, are extinct in the Tathagata. That is why he is beyond reckoning. 
In the Brahmanjara Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, the Buddha makes the following declaration about himself after refuting the 62 views, catching them all in one supernet. Comment, yeah, the comparative study of the Brahmanjala Sutta has, makes it clear that it's not the Buddha who catches anybody in a net, but that is more rather than net is spread by Mara. And also, the Brahmanjala Sutta is not really about refuting 62 views, it's more a form of psychoanalysis, as I have shown in an article in which I uploaded last time for an earlier sermon. The point, in fact, they're not even speaking about views, it's about vattu, the way how these ideas arise. So the whole point of the Brahmajana Sutta, which is often seen as a refutation of actually existing views in ancient India, is, I think, quite different. It is about a psychoanalysis of the arising of views, of their dependency on contact and feeling, etc. End of comment. Uchinna bhava netindiko bhikkave tatagata se kayo tittati yava se kayo tasati tava nang da ungindi devanu sa kaya se beda undang jivita pariya dana nana da ungindi devanu sa Monks the tatagata's body stands with its leading factor in becoming cut off at the root. As long as his body stands, gods and men will see him. With the breaking up of his body, after the extinction of his life, gods and men will not see him. And then he follows up this promulgation with a simile. Seyathabi bhikkave amba pindiya vanta chinnaya yani kanchi ambani vantu pani bandhanani sabbani tani tat anvayani bhavanti evam evako bhikkave unchinna bhava nettiko tathagata sakayo tittati just as monks in the case of a bunch of mangoes when its stalk is cut off, whatever mangoes that were connected with the stalk would all of them be likewise cut off. Even so monks stands the Tathagata's body with its leading factor in becoming cut off at the root. As long as his body stands, gods and men will see him. With the breaking up of his body, after the extinction of his life, gods and men will not see him. Comment translation by Walsh. Amongst the body of the Tathagata stands with the link that bound it to becoming cut. As long as the body subsists, devas and humans will see him. But at the breaking up of the body and the exhaustion of the lifespan, devas and humans will see him no more. Monks, just as when the stalk of a bunch of mangoes has been cut, all the mangoes on it go with it, just so the Tathagata's link with becoming has been cut. As long as the body subsists, devas and humans will see him. But at the breaking up of the body and the exhaustion of the lifespan, devas and humans will see him no more. And the Dirga Agama, parallel. The Tathagata knows that for himself, Birth and death have been eradicated. He makes use of this existing body because of his wish to bring happiness and deliverance to devas and human beings. If there were not that body, devas and men in the world would have nothing to rely on. It is just like a palmyra tree whose top part has been cut off, which will not come to growth again. The Buddha is just like that. Having eradicated birth and death, he will never come to be born again. End of comment. The simile employed serves to bring out the fact that the Tathagata's body stands with its leading factor in becoming eradicated. Here it is said that gods and men see the Tathagata while he is alive. But the implications of this statement should be understood within the context of the similes given. The reference here is to a tree uprooted, one that simply stands cut off at the root. In regard to each aggregate of the Buddha and other emancipated ones, it is clearly stated that it is cut off at the root, Uchinnamula, that is like a palm tree divested of its side, Tal Avatukkatu. In the case of a palm tree deprived of its natural side but still left standing, 
Anyone seeing it from afar would mistake it for an actual tree that is growing. It is the same idea that emerges from the simile of the bunch of mangoes. The Tathagata is comparable to a bunch of mangoes with its stalk cut off. What then is meant by the statement that gods and men see him? Their seeing is limited to the seeing of his body. For many, the concept of seeing the Tathagata is just the seeing of his physical body. Of course, we do not find in this discourse any prediction that we can see him after 5,000 years. Whatever it may be, here we seem to have some deep idea underlying this discourse. An extremely important clue to a correct understanding of this Dhamma, one that helps to straighten up right view, lies beneath this problem of the Buddha's refusal to answer the Tetralemma concerning the Tathagata. This fact comes to light in the Yamaka Sutta of the Kanda Sangyutta. A monk named Yamaka conceived the evil view, the distorted view. Tatahang Bhagavata Dhammang Desitangaja Nami Yata Kina Sabu Bhikku Kaya Sabida Ujjijjiti Vinasati Nahuti Param Marana. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Exalted One, an influx free monk with the breaking up of his body is annihilated and perishes, does not exist after death. Translation, comment, translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a bhikkhu whose stains are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. And the Samyukta Agama parallel. As I understand the Dharma taught by the Buddha, an Arahant, with the influxes being eradicated, will not exist anywhere after the body breaks up at the end of life. End of comment. He went about saying that the Buddha had declared that the emancipated monk is annihilated at death. Other monks, on hearing this, tried their best to dispel his wrong view, saying that the Buddha had never declared so, but it was in vain. At last they approached Venerable Sariputta and begged him to handle the situation. Then Venerable Sariputta came there and, after ascertaining the fact, proceeded to dispel Venerable Yamaka's wrong view by getting him to answer a series of questions. The first set of questions happened to be identical with the one the Buddha had put forward in Venerable Anurada's case, namely a catechism on the three characteristics. We have already quoted it step by step for facility of understanding. Suffice it to mention in brief that it served to convince Venerable Yamaka of the fact that whatever is impermanent, suffering and subject to change is not fit to be looked upon as this is mine, this am I and this is myself. The first step, therefore, consisted in emphasizing the not-self characteristic through a catechism on the three signata. The next step was to get Venerable Yamaka to reflect on this not-self characteristic in eleven ways, according to the standard formula. Tasmati avuso yamaka yankinji rupang atita anagata pannang ajhatantang va bahitanda va ullaritang va sukumang va inang va panitang va Yang Dure Santikeva, Sabang Rupang, Netang Mama, Neswam Asmi, Namiswa Tati, Eva Metang, Yatha Bhutang, Samma Panyaya Dattamba, Ya Kachi Vitana, Ya Kachi Sanya, Yakichi Sankara, Yang Kinchi Vinyana, Atita Na Gatta Panjupanang, Ajatang Ba, Bindava, Ularikang Ba, Sukumang Ba, Hinang Ba, Panitang Ba, Yang Dure Santikeva, Sabang binyana netang mama nesaham asmi namisu atati eva metang yatambhutam samang panyaya dattambam evang pasang avu su yamaka suttava arya savako rupasming nipbindati vidanaya nipbindati sanyaya nipbindati sankhari su nipbindati vinyana sming nipbindati nipbindang virajati viraga vimuchati vimutasming vimutam itinyanan hoti Kina jati usitam brahmacharyam katam karaniyam naparang itatayati pajanati. Therefore, friend Yamaka, any kind of form whatsoever, whether past, future, present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all form must be seen as it really is with right wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling whatsoever any kind of perception whatsoever, any kind of preparations whatsoever, 
any kind of consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future, present, internal, external, cross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, all consciousness must be seen as it really is with right wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Seeing thus, friend Yamaka, the instructed noble disciple gets disgusted of form, gets disgusted of feeling, gets disgusted of perception, gets disgusted of preparations, gets disgusted of consciousness. Being disgusted, he becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated, and he understands. Extinct is birth, lived is the holy life. Done is what had to be done. There is no more of this state of being. As the third step in his interrogation of Venerable Yamaka, Venerable Sariputta poses the same questions which the Buddha had addressed to Venerable Anuradha. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard form as the Tathagata? No, friend. Do you regard feeling, perception, preparations, consciousness as the Tathagata? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as info? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from form? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in feeling? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from feeling? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in perception? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from perception? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in preparations? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from preparations? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in consciousness? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from consciousness? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard form, feeling, perception, preparations, and consciousness as constituting the Tathagata? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is devoid of form, feeling, perception, preparation, and consciousness? No, friend. It was at this juncture that Venom put to put his conclusive question to Venom Yamaka in order to drive the crucial point home. But then, friend Yamaka, now that for you the target is not to be found in truth and fact here in this very life, is it proper for you to declare, as I understand Dhamma taught by the Exalted One, an infect's free monk is annihilated and destroyed when the body breaks up and does not exist after death? Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard form as the Tathagata? No, friend. Do you regard feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness as the Tathagata? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as in form? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as apart from form? No, friend. Do you regard the Tathagata as in feeling, as apart from feeling, as in perception, as apart from perception, as in volition formations, as apart from volition formations, as in consciousness, as apart from consciousness? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness taken together as the Tathagata? No, friend. What do you think, friend Yamaka? Do you regard the Tathagata as one who is without form, without feeling? without perception, without volitional formations, without consciousness. No, friend. But, friend, when the Tathagata is not apprehended by you as real and actual here in this very life, is it fitting for you to declare, as I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, a bhikkhu whose stains are destroyed is annihilated and perishes with the breakup of the body and does not exist after death. And here is the Samyukta Agma parallel. Sariputta asked again, How is it, Yamaka? Is bodily form the Tathagata? Yamaka replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta asked again, Is feeling, perception, formation, consciousness the Tathagata? Yamaka replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta asked again, How is it, Yamaka? Is the Tathagata distinct from bodily form? Is the Tathagata distinct from feeling, perception, <coughs> formations, consciousness? Yamaka replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta asked again, Is the Tathagata in bodily form? Is the Tathagata in feeling, perception, formations, consciousness? Yamaka replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta asked again, Is bodily form in the Tathagata? Is feeling, perception, formation, consciousness in the Tathagata? Yamaka replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta asked again, 
instead of target of without bodily form, feeling, perception, formation, consciousness. Young Raga replied, No, Venerable Sariputta. Sariputta said, In this way, Yamaka, the Tathagata is existing, truly, here and now, cannot be gotten at anywhere, cannot be designated anywhere. Why do you say, as I understand the Dharma taught by the Buddha, an Arahant, with the influxes being eradicated, will not exist anywhere after the body breaks up at the end of life? Is that properly spoken? End of comment. At last, Venerable Yamaka confesses, for many friends, Sariputta, I did hold that evil view, ignorant as I was. But now that I have heard this Dhamma sermon of the Venerable Sariputta, I have given up that evil view and have gained an understanding of the Dhamma. As if to get a confirmation of Venerable Yamaka's present stance, Venerable Sariputta continues. If friend Yamaka, they were to ask you the question, friend Yamaka, as to that monk, the influx-free Arahant, what happens to him with the breaking up of the body after death? Being asked thus, what would you answer? If they were to ask me that question, friend Sariputta, I would answer in this way. Friends, form is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Feeling, perception, preparations, consciousness is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Thus questioned, I would answer in such a way. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. If friend Yamaka, they were to ask you, friend Yamaka, when a Bhikkhu is an Arahant, one whose stains are destroyed, what happens to him with the breakup of the body after death? Being asked thus, what would you answer? If they were to ask me this, friend, I would answer thus. Friends, form is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Feeling, perception, volition, formations, consciousness is impermanent. What is impermanent is suffering. What is suffering has ceased and passed away. Being asked as friend, I would answer in such a way. And here is the Samyukta Adama. Sariputta asked again, Yamaka, if you are further asked, Monk, as you earlier declared an evil wrong view, knowing and seeing what has this now all been completely removed. What would you answer? Yamaka replied, Venerable Sariputta, if someone comes and asks, I would answer in this way, the bodily form of an arahant with the influxes being eradicated is impermanent. What is impermanent is Dukkha. What is Dukkha has become tranquil and become cool. It has forever disappeared. Feeling, perception, formation, consciousness, also like that. If someone comes and asks, I would answer in this way. End of comment. Be it noted that in this conclusive answer there is no mention whatsoever of a Tathagata, a Sattva or a Pugvala. Now in this reply, when Sariputta expresses his approbation, Good, good, friend Yamaka. Well then, friend Yamaka, I will bring up a simile for you that you may grasp this meaning all the more clearly. Suppose, friend Yamaka, there was a householder or a householder's son, prosperous, with much wealth and property, protected by a bodyguard. Then some man would come by who wished to ruin him, to harm him, to imperil him, and to deprive him of life. And it would occur to that man, this householder or householder's son is prosperous, with much wealth and property. He has his bodyguard. It is not easy to deprive him of his life by force. What if I were to get close to him and take his life? Then he would approach that householder or householder's son and say to him, Would you take me on as a servant, sir? And then the householder or householder's son would take him on as a servant. The man would serve him, rising up before him, going to bed after him, being at his beck and call, <coughs> pleasing in his conduct, endearing in his speech. The householder or householder's son would regard him as a friend, an intimate friend, and would place trust in him. But once the man has ascertained that the householder or householder's son has trust in him, he waits for an opportunity to find him alone and kills him with a sharp knife. Now this is the simile. Based on this deep simile, Venerable Sariputta puts the following questions to Venerable Yamaka to see whether he has grasped the moral behind it. What do you think, friend Yamaka, when that man approached that householder or householder's son and said to him, Would you take me on as a servant, sir? Wasn't he a murderer even then? Though the householder or householder's son did not know him as my murderer. And when the man was serving him, 
rising up before him, going to bed after him, being at his beck and call, pleasing in his conduct, endearing in his speech. Wasn't he a murderer then too? Though the householder or householder's son did not know him as my murderer. And when the man, finding him alone, took his life with a sharp knife, wasn't he a murderer then too? Though the other did not know him as my murderer. Venal Yamaka answers, yes, friend, by way of assent to all these matter-of-fact questions. Comment, translation by Bikabodi. Suppose, friend Yamaka, there was a householder, a householder's son, a rich man with much wealth and property, protected by a bodyguard. Then some man would appear who wanted to ruin him, to harm him, to endanger him, to take his life. It would occur to that man, this household or household, a son is a rich man with much wealth and property, protected by a bodyguard. It won't be easy to take his life by force. Let me get close to him and then take his life. Then he would approach that household or householder's son and say to him, I would serve you, sir. Then the householder or householder's son would appoint him as a servant. The man would serve him, rising up before him, retiring after him, doing whatever he wants, agreeable in his conduct, endearing in his speech. The householder or householder's son would consider him a friend, a bosom friend, and he would place trust in him. But when the man becomes aware that the householder or householder's son has placed trust in him, then, finding him alone, he would take his life with a sharp knife. What do you think, friend Yamaka, when that man had approached that householder or householder's son and said to him, I will serve you, sir? Wasn't he a murderer even then, though the other did not recognize him as my murderer? And when the man was serving him, rising up before him, retiring after him, doing whatever he wants, agreeable in his conduct, endearing in his speech, wasn't he a murderer then too, though the other did not recognize him as my murderer? And when the man came upon him while he was alone and took his life with a sharp knife, wasn't he a murderer then too, though the other did not recognize him as my murderer? And it is some Yukta Adama version. It is like the son of a householder, a son of a householder who is very rich and has much wealth. He seeks wildly for retinue that well protects his wealth. Then an evil person who is his enemy pretends to have come as a close friend in order to become his retainer. He often waits for an opportunity, going to sleep late and rising early, looking after him nearby when he rests. He is careful and respectful in his affairs, modest in his words, causing his master to think of him with delight, to perceive him as a friend, to perceive him as a son, with utmost trust and without doubt, without guarding himself. Later on, with a sharp knife in his hand, he cuts off his master's life. Monk Yamaka, what do you think, that evil enemy, acting as the householder's friend? Was he not acting from the outset as an expedient, with the mind intent on harm, constantly waiting for an opportunity until bringing about the householder's end? Yet that householder was not able to realize it, until the moment he suffered harm. End of comment. It was then that Venable Sariputta comes out with the full significance of this simile, portraying the uninstructed worldling in the same light as that naively unsuspecting and ignorant household or householder's son. So too, friend Yamaka, the uninstructed worldling who has no regard for the noble ones and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, who has no regard for good men and is unskilled and undisciplined in their Dhamma, regards form of self or self as possessing form or form as in self, or self as in form. He regards feeling as self, perception as self, preparations as self, consciousness as self. He doesn't understand as it really is, impermanent form as impermanent form, impermanent feeling as impermanent feeling, impermanent perception as impermanent perception, impermanent preparations as impermanent preparations, impermanent consciousness as impermanent consciousness. He does not understand as it really is painful form as painful form, painful feelings as painful feelings, painful perception as painful perception, painful preparations as painful preparations, painful consciousness as painful consciousness. He does not understand as it really is selfless form as selfless form, selfless feeling as selfless feeling, selfless perception as selfless perception, selfless preparations as selfless preparations, selfless consciousness as selfless consciousness. He does not understand as it really is prepared form as prepared form, 
prepared feeling as prepared feeling, prepared perception as prepared perception, prepared preparations as prepared preparations, prepared consciousness as prepared consciousness. He does not understand as it really is murderous form as murderous form, murderous feeling as murderous feeling, murderous perception as murderous perception, murderous preparations as murderous preparations, murderous consciousness as murderous consciousness. This, then, is what the attitude of the uninstructed worldling amounts to. When Masai Buddha now goes on to describe the consequences of such an attitude for the worldling, so rupam upeti upadiya dati tati attameti vedanam sanyam sankhare jnana upeti upadiya di ati tati attameti tasime panchupadana kankhanda upeta upadinna digaratan aitaya dukkaya sam uratantati he becomes committed to form, grasps it, and takes a stand upon it as myself. He becomes committed to feeling, to perception, to preparations, to consciousness, grasps it, and takes a stand upon it as myself. These five aggregates of grasping, to which he becomes committed, and which he grasps, lead to his harm and suffering for a long time. Then Venerable Sariputta contrasts it with the standpoint of the instructed disciple. But, friend, the instructed noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones, who is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, who is regard for good men and is skilled and disciplined in their Dhamma, does not regard form as self, or self as possessing form, or form as in self, or self as in form. He does not regard feeling as self, perception as self, preparations as self, consciousness as self, or self as possessing consciousness, or consciousness in self, or self as in consciousness. He understands as it really is impermanent form as impermanent form, impermanent feeling as impermanent feeling, impermanent perception as impermanent perception, impermanent preparations as impermanent preparations, impermanent consciousness as impermanent consciousness. He understands as it really is painful form as painful form, painful feeling as painful feeling, painful perception as painful perception, painful preparations as painful preparations. Painful consciousness as painful consciousness. He understands as it really is selfless form as selfless form, selfless feeling as selfless feeling, selfless perception as selfless perception, selfless preparations as selfless preparations, selfish consciousness as selfless consciousness. He understands as it really is prepared form as prepared form, prepared feeling as prepared feeling, prepared perception as prepared perception. Prepared preparations as prepared preparations, prepared consciousness as prepared consciousness. He understands as it really is murderous form as murderous form, murderous feeling as murderous feeling, murderous perception as murderous perception, murderous preparations as murderous preparations, murderous consciousness as murderous consciousness. He does not become committed to form does not grasp it, does not take a stand upon it as myself. He does not become committed to feeling, to perception, to preparations, to consciousness, does not grasp it, does not take a stand upon it as myself. These five aggregates of grasping to which he does not become committed, to which he does not grasp, lead to his wealth and happiness for a long time. Comment. Because the passage in the original is already very long and repetitive, I have not provided alternative translations or the Chinese parallel. But I just wanted to make two comments. One is that I think the translation as painful form and painful feeling, I would probably prefer to translate it slightly differently because, for example, to say he understands painful feeling as painful feeling gives the, can give the impression that only one of the three types of feeling is meant. But actually, it's the passage means all type of feelings and so in order to make that clear I would probably prefer another translation of Dukkha maybe unsatisfactory nature, unsatisfactory feeling as unsatisfactory feeling or something like that. And also the qualification of the five aggregates as murderous. I think we have to put that a little bit in context. I think uh, this is a qualification we don't find elsewhere in the suttas. And so it is probably best understood as something quite specific to the context. And given that Yamaka had an annihilationist view, and as we are going to hear very soon now, 
he made a major breakthrough to, thanks to this exposition. My own interpretation would be that given his annihilationist thrust, the first step was to clarify that underneath that uh, negative attitude that Venom Yamaka had, there was actually clinging to a self. And when that was cleared out, the using that same sort of negativity but pointing towards the five aggregates of clinging, and it is the clinging in particular that is being problematized here, pointing to them with a somewhat strong kind of terminology was suitable for the particular situation of Venom Yamaka, but it need not necessarily be suitable for others who do not have such a tendency. So it's just to put this whole a little bit uh, into perspective. End of comment. What Venerable Sariputta wanted to prove was the fact that every one of the five aggregates is a murderer, though the worldlings, ignorant of the true state of affairs, pride themselves on each of them, saying, This is mine, this am I, and this is myself. As the grand final of this instructive discourse comes the following wonderful declaration by Venerable Yamaka. Such things do happen, friend Sariputta, to those venerable ones who have sympathetic and benevolent fellow monks in the holy life, like you, to admonish and instruct. So much so that on hearing this Dhamma sermon of the Venerable Sariputta, my mind is liberated from the influxes by non grasping. Comment ya, ya Samyukta Agama also reports his attainment, not as tied with speech, but just reporting that when the Venerable Sariputta spoke this teaching, the monk Yamaka, by not clinging, attained liberation from the influxes in his mind. End of comment. And this might sound extremely strange, in this age of skepticism regarding such intrinsic qualities of the Dhamma like Sanditika, visible here and now, Akarika timeless, and Hipasika inviting to come and see. But all the same, we have to grant the fact that this discourse, which begins with the Venerable Yamaka, who is bigoted, with such a viral and evil view, which even his fellow monks found it difficult to dispel, concludes, as we saw, with this grand final of a Venerable Yamaka joyfully declaring his attainment of Arandhu. This episode bears testimony to the fact that the tetralemma concerning the Tathagata's after-death state has beneath it an extremely valuable criterion proper to this Dhamma. There are some who are even scared to discuss this topic, perhaps due to unbalanced faith, faith unwarranted by wisdom. The tetralemma, however, reveals on analysis a wealth of valuable Dhamma material that calls to purify one's right view. That is why the Venerable Yamaka ended up as an Arahant. So, this discourse also is further proof of the fact that the Buddha's solution to the problem of the indeterminate points actually took the form of a disquisition on voidness. Such exposition fall into the category called Sunyata Patisanyata Suttanta, discourses dealing with voidness. This category of discourses avoids the conventional worldly usage such as Satta being and Pugala person, and highlights the teachings on the Four Noble Truths, which bring out the nature of things as they are. Generally, such discourses instill fear into the minds of worldlings, so much so that even during the Buddha's time there were those who recorded instances of misconstruing and misinterpretation. It is in this light that we have to appreciate the Buddha's prediction that in the future there will be monks who would not like to listen or lend ear to those deep and profound discourses of the Buddha pertaining to the supramundane and dealing with the void. Punichaparang bhikkha vibhavisanti bhikkha nagata maddana abhavita kaya abhavita sila abhavita chitta abhavita panya te abhavita kaya samana abhavita sila abhavita chitta abhavita panya ete suttanta tathagata bhasita gambira gambiratta Lukuttara, sunyata pati sanyata, te subhanyamane sana susu santi, na sotam oda his santi, na anya chittam upatta pesanti, na chati dhamme ugae tabbam pariyapuni tabbam manyes santi. 
And moreover, monks there will be in the future those monks who are being undeveloped in bodily conduct, being undeveloped in morality, being undeveloped in concentration, being undeveloped in wisdom, would not like to listen, to lend ear, or to make an attempt to understand and deem it fit to learn when those discourses preached by the Tathagata, which are deep, profound in meaning, supramundane in dealing with the void, are being recited. Comment translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Again, in the future there will be bhikkhus who are undeveloped in body, virtuous behavior, mind and wisdom. When those discourses spoken by the Tathagata being recited that are deep, deep in meaning, world transcending, connected with emptiness, they will not want to listen to them, will not lend an ear to them, or apply their minds to understand them. They will not think those teachings should be studied and learned. End of comment. This brings us to an extremely deep dimension of this Dhamma. By way of clarification, we may allude to a kind of exorcism practiced by some traditional devil dancers. At the end of an all-night session of devil dancing, the mediating priest goes round, exorcising the spirits from the house with fistfuls of a highly inflammable incense powder. Blazing flames arise as he sprinkles that powder onto the lighted torch, directing the flames at every nook and corner of the house. Some onlookers even get scared that he's trying to set the house on fire, but actually no harm is done. Well, the Buddha too, as the mediating priest of the three realms, had to conduct a similar exercising ritual over linguistic conventions, aiming at some words in particular. It is true that he made use of conventional language in order to convey his teaching, but his Dhamma proper was one that transcended logic, Atakkavachana. It happened to be a Dhamma that soared well above the limitations of grammar and logic and analytically exposed their very structure. The marvel of the Dhamma is its very inaccessibility to logic. That is why it defied the four-cornered logic of the Tetralemma. It refused to be cornered and went beyond the concepts of a being or a self. The samsaric vortex was breached and concepts themselves were transcended. Now, this is the exorcism the Buddha had to carry out. He smoked out the term Atta, self, so dear to the whole world. Of course, he could not help making use of that word as such. In fact, there's an entire chapter in the Dhammapada entitled Atta Vagga. But it must be emphasized that the term in that context does not refer to a permanent self. It stands for oneself. Some who mistakenly rendered it as self ended up in difficulties. Take for instance the following verse. Atta hi attano nato koi nato parusiya. Atta na hi sudante na natan lavati dullava. One self indeed is one's own saviour. What other saviour could there be? Even in oneself, disciplined well, one finds that saviour so hard to find. Common translation by Norman, the self is indeed the lord of self. Who else indeed could be the lord? By the self indeed, when well tamed, one obtains a lord who is hard to obtain. End of comment. Those who render the above verse literally with the self-bias would get stuck when confronted with the falling verse in the Balavanga, the chapter of the fourth. Puttamati dharmati itibalo vihanyati atta hi atano nati kuta putta kuta dhana. Sons I have, wealth I have, so the fool is vexed. Even oneself is not one's own. Where then are sons? Where is wealth? Common translation by Norman. Thinking I have sons, I have wealth, the fool is tormented. He has indeed no self of his own. How much less sons, how much less wealth? End of comment. Whereas the former verse says Atahi Atano Nato, here we find the statement Atahi Atano Nati. If one ignores the reflexive sense and translates the former line with something like self is the Lord of Self, one will be at a loss to translate the seemingly contradictory statement even self is not owned by self. At times the Buddha had to be incisive in regard to some words, which the worldlings are prone to misunderstand and misinterpret. We have already discussed at length the significance of such terms as Satta and Tathagata with reference to their etymological background. 
Sakai Aditi or personality view masquerades even behind the term Tathagata, and that is why they raise such ill founded questions. That is also why one is averse to penetrate into the meanings of the deep discourses. Like the term Tathagata, the term Loka also had insinuations of a self bias. The Buddha, as we saw, performed the same ritual of exorcism to smoke out those insinuations. His definition of the world, with reference to the six sense bases, is a corrective to that erroneous concept. Among the indeterminate points, too, we find questions relating to the nature of the world, such as Sasatuloko, Asasatuloko, the world is eternal, the world is not eternal, and Antavaloko, and Antavaloko, the world is finite, the world is infinite. In all such contexts, the questioner had the prejudice of the conventional concept of the world. The commentaries refer to it as Chakravala Loka, the common concept of world system. But the Buddha advanced a profound definition of the concept of the world with reference to the six bases of sense contact. In this connection, we come across a highly significant discourse in the Salaya Tanavanga of the Samyutta Nikaya. There we find the Buddha making the following declaration to the monks. Nahan vikkave gamanena lukasa antang nyatayam dattayam patteyam tivadhami. Nachapanang vikkave apatva lukasa antang dukkasa antakiriyam vadhami. Monks, I do not say that by traveling one can come to know or see or reach the end of the world. Nor do I say that without reaching the end of the world one can put an end of to suffering. Comment translation by Bowie. Because I say that the end of the world cannot be known, seen or reached by traveling. Yet because I also say that without reaching the end of the world there is no making an end to suffering. And the Chinese and the Samyukta Agama. I do not say that a person reaches the end of the world by walking. And I also do not say that without walking the path one reaches the end of the world and the unsurpassed transcendence of Dukkha. End of comment. After this riddle-like pronouncement, the Buddha gets up and retires to the monastery. We come across this kind of problematic situation earlier too. Most probably this is a device of the Buddha as a teacher to give his disciples an opportunity to train in the art of analytical exposition of the Dhamma. After the Buddha had left, those monks, perplexed by this terse and tantalizing declaration, approached Venerananda and begged him to expound its meaning at length. With some modest hesitation, as usual, Venerable Ananda agreed and came out with the way he himself understood the significance of the Buddha's declaration in the following words. Yena koa vosa lokasmim lokasan yihoti lokamani ayam ruchati ayasa vinaya loko. Kena cha vosa lokasmim lokasan yihoti lokamani chakkuna koa vosa lokasmim lokasan yihoti lokamani. Sotena, Ghanena, Jivaya, Kayena, Manena, Koavo, so Lokasming, Lokasan, Yehodi, Lokamani. Yena, Koavo, so Lokasming, Lokasan, Yehodi, Lokamani. I am Bochiti, Arias, Vinaye, Loko. Friends, that by which one has a perception of the world and a conceit of the world, that in this discipline of the noble ones is called the world. By what friends has one a perception of the world and a conceit of the world? By the eye friends one has a perception of the world and a conceit of the world. By the ear, by the nose, by the tongue, by the body and by the mind. Friends, one has a perception of the world and a conceit of the world. That friends by which one has a perception of the world and a conceit of the world, that in this discipline of the noble ones is called the world. Comment. <clears throat> Translation by Bikubodi. That in the world by which one is the perceiver of the world, the conceiver of the world, this is called the world in the noble one's discipline. And what friends is that in the world by which one is a perceiver of the world, the conceiver of the world? The eye is that in the world by which one is a perceiver of the world, the conceiver of the world. The ear, the nose. The tongue, the body, the mind is that in the world by which one is a perceiver of the world, a conceiver of the world. That in the world by which one is a perceiver of the world, a conceiver of the world, this is called the world in the noble one's discipline. And the Samyukta Agama. Whatever there is of a world 
of naming a word, of experiencing a word, of designating a word, of a linguistic expression of a word, it all enters into being reckoned as a word. When we're friends, that is, the I is a word, a naming of a word, an experiencing of a word, a designation of a word, a linguistic expression of a word, it all enters into being reckoned a word. The ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind is also like that. A learned noble disciple understands as it really is the rising of the six sense spheres, their cessation, their gratification, their danger and the escape from them. This is called a noble disciple who reaches the end of the world, who understands the world and who, having been burdened by the world, has transcended the world. And in the Samyukta Agama, Ananda continues also by giving a summary in verse, a poetic summary of this exposition. End of comment. It seems then that the definition of the world in the discipline of the noble ones is one that accords with radical attention, yonisamanasikara, whereas the concept of the world as upheld in those indeterminate points is born of wrong attention, ayonisamanasikara. In the present age too, scientists, when they speak of an end of the world, entertain presumptions based on wrong attention. When those monks who listened to Venerable Ananda's exposition reported it to the Buddha, he fully endorsed it. This definition, therefore, is as authentic as the word of the Buddha himself and conclusive enough. It is on the basis of the six sense basis that the world has a perception of the world and a conceit of the world. The conceit here meant is not pride as such, but the measuring characteristic of worldly concepts. For instance, there is this basic scale of measuring length, the inch, the span, the foot, the cubit, and the fathom. These measurements presuppose this body to be a measuring one. In fact, all scales of measurement, in some way or another, relate to one or the other of the six sense bases. That is why the above definition of the world is on the side of radical attention. The worldling's concept of the world, conventionally so called, is the product of wrong or non-radical attention. It is unreal to the extent that it is founded on the notion of the compact, Ghanasanya. The existence of the world as a whole follows the norm of arising and ceasing. It is by ignoring this norm that the notion of the compact receives acceptance. Two persons are watching a magical kettle on display at a science exhibition. Water is endlessly flowing from the magical kettle to a basin. One is waiting until the kettle gets empty, while the other one waits to see the basin overflowing. Neither of their wishes is fulfilled. Why? Because the hidden tube conducts the water in the basin back again to the kettle. So the magic kettle never gets emptied and the basin never overflows. This is the secret of the magic kettle. The world also is such a magic kettle. Gigantic world system contract and expand in a cyclic fashion. In the ancient term, term for world systems, Chakkavala, this cyclic nature is already insinuated. Taken in a broader sense, the existence or continuity of the world is cyclic, as indicated by the two terms Sangvatta and Vivatta, contraction and expansion. In both these terms, the significant word Vatta, suggestive of turning round, is seen to occur. It is as good as saying rise and fall, Udayabhaya. When one world system gets destroyed, another world system gets crystallized, as it were. We hear of Brahma mansions emerging. So the existence of the world is a continuous process of arising and ceasing. It is in a cycle. How can one find a point of beginning in a cycle? Can one speak of it as eternal or non-eternal? The question as a whole is fallacious. On the other hand, the Buddha's definition of the term loka based on the etymology Lujjati, Palujjati, Dilogo, is quite apt and meaningful. The world is all the time in a process of disintegration. It is by ignoring this disintegrating nature and by overemphasizing the rising aspect that the ordinary uninstructed worldling speaks of a world as it is conventionally understood. The world is afflicted by this process of arising and passing away in every moment of its existence. It is to be found in our breathing too, our entire body vibrates to the rhythm of this rise and fall. That is why the Buddha offered us a redefinition of the world. According to the terminology of the noble ones, the world is to be redefined with reference to the six bases of sense contact. 
This includes mind and mind objects as well. In fact, the range of the six spaces of contact is all comprehending. Nothing falls out of it, outside of it. 